Hello and welcome back to the lab. Today what I have for you is the FS752 GNSS Discipline Time and Frequency Reference from Stanford Research. This is a piece of equipment that I've wanted for quite some time and I finally got around to buying one. It is, uh, as the name implies, a standard for time and frequency within the lab. And so this is going to be the primary 10 megahertz reference for all of the instrumentation in the lab and also will provide uh, one pulse per second output if I should need that in the future. So you might be asking yourself at this point, what exactly is a GNSS discipline time and frequency reference? It is a local oscillator that runs at a standard frequency, typically 10 megahertz, that is uh, locked by a PLL to a time reference coming from satellite navigation systems or global navigation satellite system, GNSS. And so some of the earlier ones only supported the U.S. GPS system. Hence, you may have heard them referred to as GPSDO, GPS Disciplined Oscillator. A lot of the more modern ones support multiple different constellations. This particular one supports GPS, GLONASS, Beidou, and uh, Galileo. And so it can track any or all of these and derive timing references from all of them. Satellite navigation systems are actually an excellent source for a high precision time reference because the way that they work is by measuring the time shifts between atomic clocks on orbiting reference stations at known positions and triangulating your location by knowing where the satellite is and what the propagation delay the signal from each one to you is. And so if you already know where you are, or alternatively, if you're able to take some measurements over a long period of time and average out any error that might be coming from atmospheric disturbances or RF noise and so on, you can determine where you are to an extremely high degree of accuracy, and then by continually receiving this time signal, determine the time with a very high degree of accuracy. And so you might be thinking that the logical next step is just to take this time signal and output it directly. Unfortunately, although Satellite navigation time provides an excellent source of long-term stability. The short-term stability is actually quite poor because of multipath effects and noise in the receivers and so on. And so that the way that these instruments are typically built is uh, you will have uh, a local oscillator that runs at some frequency, typically 10 megahertz, although others do exist, and then the time reference from the satellite navigation receiver is divided down to match that and fed into a phase frequency detector. And then a PLL around all of this uh, gives you a local 10 megahertz reference with high short-term stability. Typically, this is going to be either a rubidium oscillator in some cases, or in the case of this, an oven-controlled crystal oscillator. And uh, so the local oscillator is going to track the GNSS clock over the long term, but provide filtering for short-term disturbances in the received time. And one of the other very nice things about Stanford Research products specifically is that they give extremely detailed manuals, including the full theory of operation, which we're going to go into in more depth, and full schematics. Unfortunately, I will have to just scan these or show them on camera. The PDF manual includes the theory of operation, all the introductions. Uh, there was apparently a error on SRS's part, and the PDF you can download from their website does not actually include the schematics. I did call them up earlier today, and they say they'll be correcting that, but for the purposes of this video, I am going to have to work off the hard copy. So apologies if the schematic quality isn't quite up to snuff. Looking at the front panel of the instrument, we can see there's a couple of different LED indicators. There's a antenna problem alert. There's a general out of tolerance alert. Uh, this one here will turn green when it's completed the survey. This picture was taken right after I had hooked up the unit, and so it's still figuring out where it is and getting the loop in lock. And then on the right side of the display, we've got a button that you can push to select whether you're displaying the current time, uh, delta in time between PPS and UTC, or number of satellites, SNR, latitude, longitude. There's a few other parameters you can show. My one complaint about the display is that it's way too bright. Uh, this is easy to fix in some of the later parts of the video. You'll see I have a little piece of neutral density filter taped over it, but it'd be nice if there was a brightness control somewhere in the software and I wasn't able to find one. 
Anyway, moving on to the right, we can see there's a couple more status indicators. The lock indicates that it does have a PLL lock. The stable light is off here. Again, this picture was taken right after the unit was powered on, and so it was still syncing the local oscillator to GPS and hadn't yet gotten quite where it wanted to be. And then the holdover LED will turn on if it loses GPS sync and is running off the local oscillator only. And then moving to the right, we have a 1 PPS out and a 10 megahertz out. These are the same signals that are output from the rear panel of the instrument, but just additional buffered copies, which are handy to have if you want to do some benchtop setup and you don't want to run cables around to the back. Again, the intended use case of this instrument is to be rack mounted, and so most of the outputs are on the back so that you can connect them to other instrumentation and not clutter your bench, which makes perfect sense. That's why I bought this unit, not some of the other ones. Um, but it is also nice to have the front panel outputs. I'm sure I'll be using those. And then on the far right side, there's a couple more indicators for TX and RX of the serial port. If you're doing any sort of PC control, as you can see right now on the uh, LaCroix scope right below it, I've got the management application open, so we're tracking a couple of satellites. We've got the uh, date and time, current status is survey in progress at 32%. Looking at the back side of the instrument, we have a USB port, uh, somewhat unusual for test and measurement. This is not actually USB TMC, the test and measurement class. This is actually just USB serial with an FTDI chip inside, which I actually kind of prefer. I find serial a lot easier to interface with a lot of software than USB TMC. So I don't have any issues with it. It's just a little unusual compared to what I more typically see. Next, we have relay outputs with both normally opened and normally closed contacts. I don't plan to use this, but if you wanted to have some sort of, say, a stack light in a calibration lab showing that your time reference shouldn't be trusted or something like that, uh, it is handy to have the ability to trigger external circuitry if your system is losing lock. Then the antenna input here, you can see there is an internal bias T. It provides 5 volts and is intended to drive an external active antenna. There is a single 1 pulse per second output and 4 10 megahertz outputs by default. And then to the right are the option card slots. I have this unit configured with eight additional 10 megahertz outputs because I primarily intend to use this for 10 megahertz distribution, but I've got PPS if I need it. And I'm sure I can rig up a distribution amplifier of some sort for a PPS if I find myself needing a lot of them. And then on the right, we just have power, nothing exciting there. Looking at the interior of the instrument from the rear, there is a single cooling fan visible on the left side of the instrument, which is primarily used for cooling the power supply. It's an off-the-shelf module from Delta that's nicely enclosed and shielded. We can see right here there's a grounding bolt that connects both to the power supply and to the mains inlet. There is a significant space between the power supply and uh, the logic board and all of the analog components. So we shouldn't have any uh, concerns about noise from the mains input affecting the accuracy of the outputs. Looking at one of the 10 megahertz outputs, we can see it is connected to the main logic board with this ribbon cable, which is a little interesting. I would have expected a coaxial cable for shielding, but uh, there's certainly room for a lot of grounds in here, considering all this cable really has to carry is power, ground, 10 megahertz, and PPS, since the PPS option board uses the uh, same connector. Looking at the rear, of the option card, we can see that the four BNCs are solidly attached to both the chassis and the PCB with this aluminum bracket, so shouldn't be any concerns about the connectors coming loose if you're tightening them down a little too hard or something. Not that BNCs need to be torqued, but it certainly shows some attention paid to ruggedness of the design. We have a single amplifier at the input by the ribbon cable, driving four additional amplifiers, one for each of the outputs. Each of these amplifiers has a filter network on the output to prevent any harmonics or noise from getting into the output. We want a really nice pure sign. And additionally, since all of the outputs are buffered, if there's any bad terminations or noise or anything injecting undesired stuff into the clock coming out of one port, it's not going to be able to backfeed into any of the other clocks and mess up another instrument. Turning our attention to the front of the unit, there's this interesting little mezzanine board here that connects to the two front panel BNCs. Again, the same sort of aluminum bracket on the BNCs being used for support of the connectors and attaching to the PCB. So very, very solidly constructed. This pin header here connects to the front panel display board and uh, has all of the GPIOs for the status buttons and so on. And uh, then we've got the two microstrips going back to the main board for the 10 megahertz and PPS. And I'm curious why this board needed to be a separate PCB. It doesn't look like it has any special functionality. It's not anything I would expect would need to be replaced or be 
cheaper to build. So it could just be for ease of assembly. Maybe it's just difficult to get one board the full length of the chassis into the case, and it's simpler to have this module that you can attach to the front panel and then push down onto the main board afterwards. Moving to the right, we have the power supply. It looks like we've got a switching controller here, and then the main transformer for an isolated power supply feeding across to the output side here. Some additional filtering components, and looks like two large possibly multi-output LDOs that are generating all of the other rails the board needs. Uh, looking along the edge here, we can see there are cutouts on the internal ground plane. So this entire section is isolated from all of the analog systems. Again, they're putting some effort into keeping noise from the mains away from everything that is important. And then here we have the main processor for the instrument. It's fairly small, as you would expect from something that doesn't do a lot of heavy data crunching. It's a Freescale Kinetis K10. Uh, Cortex M4 256K flash, I believe. And uh, then we've got a debug connector here and pad connect debug header here. And this is probably a reset button right there. So nicely designed for debugging and testing. Going down to the rear area, we have an FTDI USB UART that runs the Skippy interface off of the main processor. We've got the relays and uh, relay driver for controlling the external alarm output. And then here is the GPS receiver. It's an off-the-shelf module from uBlocks that provides the 10 megahertz reference. Then some discrete components here that are probably related to clock division and the PLL. We can take a closer look at that later on. And then identical copies of the same output circuit that we saw on the uh, add-on cards for each of the onboard 10 megahertz outputs. And next we get to the time base for the entire board. There's a sensor here probably for measuring ambient temperature. We can see there's relief cutouts again around the component for isolation, prevent any heat generated from elsewhere in the system from coupling into it. And then the OCXO is heated to above ambient. You can see there's two large transistors, one on each side that are providing the heat source for the outer oven module. And then under this enclosure, which is probably also being used for EM shielding, there's a second OCXO module in there that's heated to an even higher temperature and ensures extremely good thermal stability of the time base for the outputs. So at this point, we have a pretty good idea of how the system is put together. The UBlox module generates a 10 megahertz reference source that is synchronized to GPS and has extremely good long-term stability, but poor short-term stability. It's not optimized for jitter. And this is then fed into the control loop in the processor along with the 10 megahertz coming out from the OCXO, and the processor then trims the frequency of the OCXO up or down in order to keep it locked to the GPS. So fast forward from April to June, and I finally have the piece of equipment I need to continue the video. This is a Symmetricom SA22C Rubidium Oscillator. I believe this was originally developed as a component for cellular network base station devices. So rather than being a standalone instrument, it's a module that mates with a pin header to a carrier board. I had to go design a carrier board of my own here that outputs the 10 megahertz reference clock coming out of it. And what we also have for comparison here, uh, sorry for the spaghetti, I have a few other projects in progress here, is a cheap GPS DO uh, from Leo Bodnar. Uh, this was my main lab time base before I got the SRS. This is a far more affordable unit. I want to say this was maybe barely into the triple digit dollars, 150 or something like that. Uh, I don't remember what they go for uh, these days. Uh, the SRS is several thousand. Uh, I don't know what the Symmetricom module went for new. I picked this one up on eBay for 100 as well, but obviously it doesn't give me an absolute time reference. Anyway, and then we have the FS752 up here. So what I have is all three of them feeding into the oscilloscope and the scope is triggering off of the rubidium. So what we have here in NG Scope Client is the Leo Bodnar GPS DO putting out a square wave. We've got the SRS putting out a sine wave and we've got the rubidium also putting out a square wave. And what we're interested in here is specifically comparing the short to midterm 
stability and phase accuracy of these instruments relative to each other. So obviously we know all the GPS DOs are going to be really stable in the long term since they're synced to GPS. If that works at all, then obviously their long-term stability is going to be excellent. And the long-term stability of the rubidium should be quite good as well. What we're more interested in is seeing how much the phase is wandering around, what is the behavior of the PLL whenever there is an adjustment in frequency, and so on. And so if we zoom out a little bit here, what we're plotting is in the filter graph, we are taking the instantaneous phase of each of the waveforms uh, relative to time zero. And again, we're using the rubidium as our trigger. So that is being used as our phase reference for everything. And then we are averaging out the phase across the entire waveform to find the average reference phase of the entire signal and avoid having too much jitter if we've got, for example, a little bit of noise on one at the very start of the waveform. We're averaging out the overall phase of the waveform relative to a zero crossing at the start of the waveform. And then we are trending that relative phase over time. And so we can see here we've got several hours of data here. And they're all actually quite well matched. If we see here the frequency of this phase shift is on the order of one full cycle per minute. So this is, if my uh, math is right, about 16 millihertz of drift between the GPS DOs and uh, the rubidium. And we can see again, the GPS DOs are fairly well aligned to each other as well. Uh, but there is a small amount of drift. What's more interesting though, is we can see that the phase shift of the SRS versus the rubidium is a very smooth sawtooth. There's a few artifacts right on the edges just where we have the uh, discontinuity in the phase. That's purely a display artifact. That's not an actual uh, signal issue. But we can see that it's very smooth even if we zoom in. It's very smooth and we're pretty much just down to measurement noise at this point seeing that little ripple on the edge but it's an extremely smooth sawtooth it's not shifting in frequency and so whatever pll they are using in uh, the uh, srs as well as uh, the uh, reference oscillator the double ocxo is an extremely stable source that's going to have very low jitter and not be bouncing around too much and then if we compare this to the leo bodnar again zooming out a little bit we can see they are fairly closely synced there's a slight amount of phase shifts over the course of the last this is about half an hour we can see it's gone from slightly lagging to almost in phase uh, with the srs but this is this is an extremely small shift. We're talking on the order of half of a 10 megahertz period, so about 50 nanoseconds of drift in half an hour, so extremely small. What's more interesting is if we look at the slope of this line, we'll notice that the slope of the phase shift on the Leo Bodnar is slightly inconsistent. Some of these edges aren't quite straight because it's bumping up a bit here, it's bumping up a bit here. If I zoom in, it's a little bit a little easier to see. There's some bumps here, there's some bumps here. And so these are presumably frequency corrections being made by the firmware on that GPSDO to discipline the local TCXO to better synchronize with GPS. And we can see that the Leo Bodnar is definitely making more aggressive corrections. How much of that is variations in PLL dynamics? Maybe their loop bandwidth is just a little bit higher than the RSRS, and so it makes more aggressive corrections. Uh, it is also possible that it's due to the reference clock being less stable. Again, the Leo is using a TCXO rather than an OCXO, and so the short-term stability of the oscillator is going to be a little bit worse. So... There is definitely a measurable difference. Again, scrolling back here, we can see there, there are very small shifts. We're talking on the order of maybe 10 or 20 degrees over several seconds of phase shift. So they're not large, but they are measurable. And so it's interesting to see that, yes, the higher end GPS DO does actually have measurably better stability. But at the same time, um, the Leo is not a bad unit. I was using it as my lab time base for quite some time. It's over an order of magnitude less expensive. And without a rubidium standard, you're probably going to have a hard time seeing the difference. That being said, the difference is measurable. So uh, I bought the rubidium just to take this measurement. And this is kind of what I was expecting to see. I was expecting to see the Leo bouncing around a little bit more than the SRS. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. And again, the difference is small, but it's measurable. So uh, it's interesting to finally be able to take that measurement and uh, have equipment with the frequency accuracy to actually be able to see it reliably. 
So uh, with that, I think that's pretty much uh, all I have for you. Again, the FS752 is now my primary lab time base, so you're going to be seeing it a lot more moving forward, just in the background, providing time references for everything else. I don't expect to be doing any more experiments with it per se. It's just going to kind of become part of the infrastructure of the facility. But hope this was an interesting uh, view, and thank you for watching.